Let's take our Bibles together tonight, and let's go to the book of Esther, chapter number four, please, the fourth chapter in the book of Esther, and um, I don't know if you caught the uh, beginning portion there of that song, but he talked about uh, the stars, and uh, some of you are aware that just this week, NASA uh, put another rover on Mars, and uh, I watched some of that unfold, and uh, just how thrilled they were, and of course, that's quite an engineering a marvel and achievement to be able to do that, and I Again, watched as they kind of watched all of that happen and transpire. And when that thing touched down, they celebrated and they cheered. And, uh, and I, th- I thought to myself of all of the splendor of the heavens and uh, that our God made all of that. Amen. Our God created all of that. And it's a wonderful thing, an amazing thing. It just gives us a glimpse of his power and his might and his majesty and uh, his authority. And as he was singing that song, that was the first thought that entered my mind. And uh, again, for God, that's nothing. That's nothing. For us, that's quite an achievement, right? Put something on Mars. God says, I created that and I did it. I did it in a matter of just a few short days. And certainly we're uh, grateful for uh, the power, the majesty, and the incredible nature of our God. And we're going to talk tonight, titled the message is Together in Crisis. Together in Crisis. And uh, I'll tell you, it, it, it helps. Listen, it helps to understand and realize you have a big God when you're in the middle of a big crisis. Uh, that's a game changer. Uh, to realize, understand that my God is, uh, is a strong and he is a mighty and he is a powerful God. And in those moments, you're going to need that. You're going you're to want a God like that. And uh, those of us who know the Lord, that's exactly what we have. And we're certainly thankful for it. I'd like for you to stand because we're going to read the fourth chapter of the book of Esther. I think it just kind of gives the background and helps us to understand what's happening here. And so we'll begin reading in verse number one, read down through verse number 17. The Bible says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done. And of course, what was done was a law that had been passed in Persia, in the Persian empire, that on a certain day... Uh, There was going to be a a, a grace that was given to the Persians to murder all of the Jews. I mean, that is exactly the law that was signed. It was signed in the third chapter. Mordecai, of course, is a Jewish man. When he perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai into the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All of the king's servants and of the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, Who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, there shall, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Father, we thank you for this night and for your word. And we've read here in a fascinating account of a story that happened so many thousands of years ago. 
And yet, Lord, as we read it, we can see some everyday, real-life, practical, spiritual truths for us as we consider the subject of crisis and being together in crisis. And so, Lord, we pray that you teach us some things from your word tonight. Lord, as we look across this room, there are homes and there are families tonight in the midst of crisis. Some that have just come out of crisis and others that are just getting ready to enter into a period of crisis. Lord, would you teach us some things tonight that will help us tremendously during those moments. Lord, drive these truths home deep into our heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. You know, crisis seems to be all around us. I think most of us are aware, for the better part of the past year, we really, in many respects, we have been as a, as a society, as a, really as a world, we have been in crisis mode, haven't we? Now, I well remember uh, this time last year when we were all sort of oblivious to what was coming, right? I'm talking about February of 2020 and, and uh, you know, life is great and life is grand and, you know, we had heard of a, a mysterious, you know, virus and, and the toll it was taking in a faraway place like China, but uh, we foolishly assumed, at least I foolishly assumed, that, you know, we're safe from its effects, we're going to be okay, we don't have to worry about that, that's for them to deal with and I hope they get it all figured out, but uh, I'm not real concerned about that. That was, the, by and large, that was most people's attitude uh, in the early days of 2020. And little did we know, of course, how much our own lives would change uh, in the days that followed. Uh, those assumptions that we had made that we're okay and uh, this is something for other people to deal with. This is not something that we have to worry about. And can I pause here for just a moment and say, really, truthfully, we have been very blessed uh, as, as a people, as a church, uh, as a faith community. I mean, I have pastor friends who've, who've had uh, members of their church that have passed as a result of the COVID uh, virus. And, and, uh, and, and to my knowledge, we've not had anyone that has succumbed to it. We've had folks, obviously, that have gotten it, some that even spent time in a hospital, uh, but no one that has been, to my knowledge, that has been critically ill. And we give all the praise and the honor and glory to God for that, and we're certainly thankful for it. And can I also just say this, that for the most part, I think we recognize that our lives, um, our lives have, have really continued rather normally since early last summer. I mean, for the most part, with a few adjustments here and there. You know, obviously, we have the lockdown period uh, in which, you know, for eight weeks as a church, we did not meet. We met online, and we tried to stay in touch with folks virtually and digitally and that sort of thing. But really, since, you know, since last summer as a church, we have worshiped together. We've served together. And uh, really, we've done life together, and I'm so thankful for it. I, I, uh, I, I just I d derive so much strength from these weekly meetings that we have, and being around you all is such an encouragement and a help uh, to me. And, and I'm thinking even uh, of the fact that there's some things, the same things cannot be said about some in this, in this world that we're living in. Uh, just this week, news broke of a, a pastor, a Canadian pastor in the province of Alberta who was arrested. He was arrested, and to my knowledge, he is still in jail tonight in Canada, in Canada for refusing to close this church and refusing to observe the health mandates that are in place there. And um, I, I, I just want you to know, this is not, it's not happening in communist China. It's not, it's not happening, you know, behind the, uh, behind the, the walls and the, and the gates of, of North Korea. That's happening in Canada, just to the north of us. I mean, they are our neighbors in many respects. We're allies with them and we're friends with them. And I would just say, I would just say this, that listen, truly in a lot of places in the world, the crisis hour has arrived. And you and I, listen, we are foolish to assume that it will never come here. See, don't, don't get lulled into this thinking like we did this time last year. Oh, that's for those people to deal with. Now that, that's, you know, we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about that. That's in another place. That's in another part of the world. We're good. We, we bought that. Listen, we bought that line once. And we, we realized that it did come our way. Don't, don't, don't you dare think that, listen, nothing like that could ever happen in the United States of America because I'm here to tell you that it could very easily. Anyone with a discerning spirit can see that there are things that are happening and there are uh, people that are in positions of power that are not necessarily the friends of God's people. And, uh, and, and if they have their way, they'll do what they can to make life more difficult for those of us who believe the Bible, who believe God and believe God's word is true. Can I say that one of the best things about unity, about being together, togetherness, oneness, the best things about relationships are the support that, are, that can be accessed during these crisis moments that we've talked about. 
Many of you have lost loved ones in an untimely fashion. Some of you have received a devastating medical diagnosis. You've lost a job or perhaps you've had a spouse walk away from you. And in those moments, obviously, of course, you do strength from your relationship with God. But you also were greatly uplifted and helped and encouraged by your relationship with others. Sometimes just knowing that your community is near, that folks are praying for you, and that they're there to help with whatever is needed can really be the difference between hope and despair. But that's not necessarily what I'm talking about tonight. The question that I want to ask at the outset of our time together is this. What about when the crisis moment comes to everyone? When we're all in the same boat. You see, most, most crisis moments come to an individual or to a family, maybe to a, maybe to a church, but, uh, but, but not necessarily to the world as a whole or to a specific people group as a whole. But in our text tonight, we discover that a, a crisis moment has come to the Jewish people. I'm, of course, I'm referencing the times when, when really none of us are strong and, and all of us are vulnerable. Obviously, it's rare when everyone is threatened. That doesn't happen very often. But when it does, so many race to this idea of every man for himself. And, and, uh, and, and they really give no thought to other people. Now, obviously, I'm thinking of, of crisis moments that have unfolded in the last 100 years. Uh, I'm thinking of the crisis moment of the Great Depression. A period of time, a, a decade or so, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, in which just about everyone suffered the effects of the financial and economic downturn. And many, many people lost everything that they had worked their whole lifetime to earn and to accumulate. And, and here were people that were once proud, self-made men and women who are now standing in line to get some food and, and to take advantage of some charity that has been given. And uh, in a moment like that, a crisis moment that visits everyone, how do we handle that? I'm thinking of World War II and how just about everybody that was living during that time had to make a sacrifice. Some folks were making the sacrifice of sending their boys or maybe their husbands off to war and realizing this may be the last time that I ever see him again. Others that made financial sacrifices and others, again, that you know, were, were frightened and were filled with fear. I'm thinking of young children who would listen to the breaking news bulletins and the headlines as they would come across and they would hear about madmen in other parts of the world who were threatening, listen, they're threatening our very way of life and our existence. I'm obviously thinking of this period of COVID in which for a period of time, so many of us really didn't know what to think. We didn't know what was true and what wasn't true. And, and, uh, and, and how, can we, can, how can we avoid this? And how can we save ourselves and save our children, certainly save the folks that we love that maybe are a little bit older, a little bit more unhealthy? I'm thinking again of these periods of times when everyone must give and everyone must sacrifice and everyone is threatened in a certain way. These moments, we heard this phrase over and over again over the last year, we truly are all in it together. Such was the case for the Jews in the Persian Empire during the days of Esther. You know, the history of the Jews is a, really a history of idolatry. You follow the patterns, there's idolatry, and then there's chastisement from God. And then there's repentance on the part of the Jews, and then God forgives them, and then there's a repeating of that process, and they start all over again. They fall back into idolatry and God brings chastisement and then they repent and God forgives and they're right with him for a time. And then a little while later, they fall into idolatry again, worshiping false gods, wanting to be like all of the people that are living around them. After the kingdom was split under Rehoboam, Solomon's son there in the Old Testament, Israel and Judah, both, uh, both countries, both groups of people struggled with idolatry, except with Israel, there was no repentance at all. There was no period of them getting right with God and God forgiving them and then moving on. It was just God's uh, long suffering that spared them time and time again. And eventually, eventually God gave Judah over to Babylonian captivity. A captivity, listen, that lasted 70 years according to the prophet Jeremiah. Eventually, this captivity came to an end uh, with King Cyrus encouraging the Jews to return to their land and to rebuild uh, their cities and uh, the temple specifically after many decades of neglect. You can read of that in Ezra chapter number one. However, the Bible tells us in Ezra chapter two and verse number 64 that only 42,360 Jews returned to Palestine during this time. 
leaving many more hundreds of thousands still living in the Persian Empire, uh, still living in that place. These people, of course, they, had, they, they remained in their home. To them, Palestine was, was home in a, uh, in a sort of a figurative sense. Yeah, that's where I'm from. But none of them had ever spent a day there. They had never seen the temple with their own eyes. They had never seen the land of Zion. They had never seen the beautiful city of Jerusalem, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, and the Sea of Galilee. Those things were, were foreign to them. They'd only heard stories about those things. Their life had been lived in Persia. So when the call came back, hey, you can go back home and you can rebuild, they thought to themselves, why would I leave the good thing that I've got going here? I've got a home and I've got a support ne network of friends and I've got a job and, and uh, we've, got a, we, we've raised our children here and our grandchildren. Why would, I, why would I go back home? And so that explains why only 42,000 went back. These remaining people that, uh, that live there that uh, recognize, hey, listen, this place has become our home. And Esther, the queen, and her uncle Mordecai were part of this group that did not return, but they had remained in this land. Now, if, listen, if they were under the delusion that life in Babylon would be easier now that they were no longer in captivity, they were sorely mistaken. You see, it was during this time that the Jews were targeted for destruction by a wicked man named Haman. Haman's hatred of the Jews was rooted really in his disdain for Mordecai, Esther's uncle, who refused. Listen, he refused to bow to him. Haman, the king's chief advisor, told the king, listen, there's a group of people. Now think about this and try to make some connections if you can. Here's what he said. He said, there's a group of people within your kingdom, king, that are dangerous. Amen. And here's why they're dangerous, because they're different. You read it, Esther chapter 3, you'll find that's exactly what he says. He says they have different laws than we have. They have different customs than we have. They follow a different set of rules than we follow. Again, can you, can you see the connection there? Do you not suppose that there are people in our world that look at us and they say those people are dangerous because they have a different rule book than we have? Because they observe laws that the rest of us don't observe. Therefore, they're dangerous. And with that, with that as, his, uh, as, as, as the foundation of his, of his statement, he says, here's what I'd like for you to do, King. I'd like for you to give us authority to kill all of those people in a certain day. The king said, well, you're my trusted advisor. I have a lot of respect for you. And, and so I'm therefore going to sign this law. And he signed the law, never realizing, now think about this, never realizing that the woman that he had married, that he had chosen to be his queen, was one of those types of people. You see, she had, kept her, she had kept her nationality hid, hidden. She had kept her background hidden. She had not told anybody she was a Jew by the instruction of her uncle Mordecai. So I'm just trying to catch you up here to what is, what is going on. And of course, as the law is signed, word begins to spread throughout the kingdom. And Mordecai reaches out to his niece, who is the queen of, the, uh, of this country, and, and, uh, and, and he alerts her of this crisis. And here's what, here's what he says. Mordecai reminds her that though she's the queen, she is not above the law. You see, in the Persian Empire at this point in time, when the king would sign a law, no man was able to reverse it. In other words, whatever the law was, that was, literally, that was gospel. Everyone had to live by it. I remind you uh, of a similar situation that unfolded in the book of Daniel. You know the story that the men there had convinced, had tricked the king there in Babylon to sign a law, uh, to sign a law that said no one can pray to anyone for 30 days except for you, king. And of course, they did that, targeting Daniel. And when, when it was discovered, Daniel was arrested, and the king wanted, wanted so much to be able to, he, he, even though he was the king, he could not change the law. What had been decreed, what had been signed, was, uh, was something that had to be carried out. And so uh, we see here that he says to her, he says to the queen, he says, you are destined for destruction along with the rest of us because you're a Jew. So truly, listen, truly, this, this, these people were together in crisis. Now, I want us to walk through the fourth chapter, and I want us to consider how this crisis was averted, how they were able to overcome this. And I, I, believe it, I believe it really centers on their unity, their teamwork, and their togetherness. Primarily, listen, primarily Mordecai and Esther working together. But we're going to find at the end of the chapter that uh, the whole group of people come along. And, and uh, certainly as we walk through this chapter, you're going to find that there are misunderstandings and there are disagreements. There are differing realities. There's fear. But throughout all of these things, these, these two people work together, and God brought great deliverance 
through this crisis. So let me share with you three truths that I find in our text and that primarily in this fourth chapter. Number one, I want to say this, that I believe that to consider crisis, I believe that acknowledgement, acknowledgement of the crisis is crucial at the beginning. Acknowledgement that we're, that we're in a crisis, that this is bad, that this is really scary and terrifying, and, and, and we've, this is over our heads, and we've got to work together. I believe, listen, the sooner, the sooner that a group of people can come together in that reality and in that understanding, the better. Now notice in verse, verse number one, we've already read it, but the Bible says that when Mordecai perceived all that was done, he, he did what? He rent his clothes. And he put on sackcloth with ashes and he went out into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and a bitter cry. Notice, we see that Mordecai's grief signals a major crisis. Mordecai's grief signals a major crisis. You know, many times when we enter crisis mode, we, we oftentimes we're careful to project an image of confidence, right? You know, it's like, you know, I'm scared to death of this thing and you're scared to death of this thing, but I'm going to put on a brave face and I'm going to act like this is really not that big of a deal. That's not what Mordecai does here. The Bible indicates that he was full of grief. Too often we conceal our emotions. We hide our grief and we pretend as if everything is all right. And I, I suppose that I can go to the front of the line of that. As a man, I don't like to show emotions. I don't like to portray or project fear. I like to make it look like, hey, everything's okay. I'm doing all right. But Mordecai here is not shy about the conflict that is raging within him. The Bible says that he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth with ashes and he cried bitterly. Listen, he did this in public. He was not ashamed to do so. All of these are signs of great grief and great sorrow and great humility. The Bible tells us he did all of this in a very public place in the king's gate. And that he was joined with a host of Jews throughout the kingdom who did similarly. Can I say this again? That in a crisis, time is of the essence. Had Mordecai and the other Jews delayed grieving and lamenting, perhaps, listen, perhaps their deliverance would have been delayed as well. Can I just pause here and say it's okay to grieve? Amen. It's okay to show emotions during times of crisis. You know, as a pastor, I, I deal with hurting people a lot. And the folks will come into my office or I'll go into their home and, and, uh, and they'll say things like this, you know, I'm trying not to cry. I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to be brave. And I don't even know what to say to them in those moments. But here's what I want to say. I want to say it's okay to cry. You know, crying is, is an emotion that God has given us. It's an outlet in many respects. It's okay to cry. It's okay to be grieved. It's okay to be heartbroken. It's, listen, it's okay to lament. Can I even take a step further? It's okay to complain. I'm talking about people that are in real crisis. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, you know, most times in which, you know, we're complaining about the weather. Well, listen, you live in Northeast Ohio. Did you not expect it was going to snow? And I find myself sometimes complaining about the weather. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? I've lived here for 41 years. Get over it, man. This is part of life. Here's the problem. Six months from now, I'll be complaining about the heat. We complain about everything. I'm talking, listen, I'm talking about people who, who rightfully have something to complain about. Real hurt, real crisis moments, real difficulty. I don't know how I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. I don't know how I'm going to get through another day. I don't know how I'm going to survive this. That's what I'm talking about. And I want you to know something. I believe it's okay. It's okay in those moments to show emotion. But it's okay to show grief and sorrow and heartache. You're not less spiritual. Even to complain and to be bitter. You, 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 read, you read the book of Psalms and you read some of the other, uh, some of the other uh, passages of Scripture, uh, a book like Lamentations, and you'll find that it's God's people crying out and saying, God, how much longer are we going to have to live under this? How much longer are we going to have to deal with this? Are you aware? Are you aware that there's a group of people? Listen, the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, a group of people, martyrs, who are underneath the throne of God, at least in the book of Revelation. And you know what they're asking God? They're saying, Lord, how long before you avenge our blood and our death? Amen. You know what they're doing? They're complaining in heaven. Lord, how much longer before you, you bring judgment to the people that have treated us so poorly and have slain us and have taken our lives? And I'm just simply saying, listen, it's okay. It's okay to be grieved. Because it signals, listen, it signals a major crisis. But notice we see a second thought here, and that is that Esther, Esther's presence signals a spirit of innocence in many respects. Would you look at verse number four? So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and, and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved 
And she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Now, you've heard this said many times, and I think we all chuckle about it, but don't you love it when a, when a politician stands up in a speech and they say something like this, I know how you feel. And we sit there and we think, you have no idea how I feel. You, you fly around in private jets and and you have homes in all different places, and you've got bodyguards, and you've got offices here and there and everywhere. You can, you can take a trip to Mexico during the middle of a crisis. You don't know how I feel. I mean, really, let's just be honest, right? So here is Esther, and she's living in the palace. And she, she begins to hear some things that are going on. She hears, wow, there's a, there's a crisis going on out there, and, and she gets briefed on it. But I, ha- I just have to think, the Bible says that she was grieved in verse number four, but sort of what she does afterwards in the conversation that she has with Mordecai seems to indicate that she doesn't fully get the weight of what's happening. Look, look what she does at the end of verse number four. The Bible says, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai. It's a present. Uncle Mordecai, here's a... Here's a new set of clothes. Put this on. I've heard, I've heard you've clothed yourself in sackcloth with ashes. And I've heard you've been crying in the very public place. And, 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 uh, and, and you, need to, you need to be strong. And you need to, uh, to, 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 to show confidence and, and power and authority. So, so take the sackcloth with ashes off and put this new raiment on. I mean, that's what she tells them to do. She doesn't get it. She doesn't fully understand. And, and I just want to say that well-meaning people sometimes will come to someone who's in crisis and they'll say something like, man, pull it together. Get your act together. You're all right. Come on, let's go. You're going to be fine. You're saved, aren't you? You know the Lord, don't you? Don't you know this promise in the Bible? Now, I think that these people are well-meaning, but they don't get it. They're not, listen, they're not in our shoes. They don't, know what it, they don't know what it's like to deal with whatever it is is the crisis that has come into your life and that has visited your home. Or perhaps maybe they've been there before, but it's been so long since they've been there that their senses have sort of been dulled. And it's almost as if they don't remember what it's like. And Esther, she sends this gift to Mordecai in an effort to sort of save face for him and from the shame of wearing sackcloth with ashes in a public place. And she sends Mordecai raiment, but notice he refuses to wear it. He says, no, I'm not done grieving. I want you to understand, Esther, that this is serious what we're dealing with out here. And just because you're sitting in the palace and you think everything is okay, I want you to understand something. This is a major crisis, and you better figure it out, and you better figure it out soon. So we see that acknowledgement, I believe, is so, so very important. But notice, secondly, we see here that communication is vital, I believe, throughout the duration of the crisis. The bulk of Esther chapter number 4 is a conversation A back and forth conversation between Mordecai and Esther. And I want us to I want us to observe the different elements and the details of this conversation. Number one, I want you to notice that part of this communication features two, number one, two primary questions. We see them in verse number five. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai. Notice here's the questions to know what it was and why it was. So the two primary questions are found here, and that they are these. What is it? What is it that you're wearing sackcloth with ashes about? What is it that you're crying publicly in the street about, and why is it? What is it, and why is it? You know, most of the time when we enter crisis, we want, we want to know. We want to know what's happening, and why is it happening? And those are reasonable questions for us to ask. There's nothing wrong with asking those questions. What is happening to me, and why is this happening to me? Let me just remind you for just a moment, you'll probably figure out the what before you figure out the why. And can I also just say this? Some of you, you may live your entire life and never figure out the why. There are times, there are times in which God, listen, God conceals things. He just doesn't intend for us to know them, and it's okay. It's okay. We just trust Him in those moments. But that's the question she asked. She asked, what is it and why is it? So there's the two primary questions we think about the communication. But notice, notice secondly, we see the answers to the questions in verses 7 and 8. 
And notice that Mordecai had done his homework. The Bible says Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised. Also, verse number eight, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree. I mean, he had a copy of the law that had been signed. He, I mean, he, he, had, he, had, he had all of his ducks in a row, everything figured out. He knew, he knew what had happened and he knew why it had happened. While Esther enjoyed life behind the walls of the palace, Mordecai had been living in the community. He had seen, listen, Mordecai had seen the hatred and the disdain that was coming his way from Haman. And he knew, listen, he knew what he was capable of because he was a man of great authority. He had rubbed shoulders with the Jews in Shushan, and he knew how they were feeling, and that they were feeling as vulnerable as he was. And I'm thinking to myself, Esther must have listened so intently to the details of Mordecai's story, because she hadn't lived it. Trying to understand, trying to recognize what's going on here. And so we see that there are two primary questions as part of their communication. There's some answers that are given as part of this communication. But notice, thirdly, there's a challenge. Look with me at the challenge in verse number 8. It says, and, and he... And he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her, <clears throat> notice, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. I don't know about you, but I like Mordecai. Amen. I mean, here's a man who is driven. Here's a man who not only, listen, not only can assess the, the problems, but, but he also has a plan. You know, one of the most frustrating things in all the world is, you know, the complaint department. And, and when the complaint department is nothing more than a complaint. You know what is really nice is when someone says, hey, listen, I've noticed that we have an area of weakness in our church or we have an area of weakness in our home. And, uh, and, and here's, here's, here's what I propose be done. And I'm, I'm willing to step up and I'm willing to, I'm willing to serve in this capacity. Mordecai here, he doesn't, he doesn't just have the answers to the questions, but he says, I also have a plan. And Esther, you're the one. You're in a position where you can do something about this. None of us, el none of, none of us else can, can, can do what, what you can do. You are in this place. And he challenges her to go before the king. And God, I believe, had given Mordecai great wisdom. And again, I believe we see evidence of that in our text. And Mordecai, I believe that Esther was the one who was able to help them overcome this crisis. And so he challenges her. You go before the king and you plead for mercy for you and for our people. But notice as we continue in this communication, we discover two realities. Two realities. We see them in verse number 11 and verse number 13. I want you to see, first of all, her reality. We see that in verse number 11, don't we? Here's her reality. Here's what she says. She says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to him to come in unto the king these 30 days. So what's her reality? Here's her reality. Here's what she says. Boil it all down to this. She says, I've not been invited before the king. And even though I'm his wife, and I'm the queen, the law states that I must be invited before him. Now, 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 now think about this for a moment. She is, she is acknowledging the law in this situation. Mordecai is going to come back on her in just a moment with that same concept. But she recognizes, even though I'm the queen, even though I have some level of authority and I dwell in the palace, I'm still under the law. And if I go before him and I appear before him and I'm not invited and he doesn't hold out the golden scepter to me, I will be put to death. That was her reality. She says, I've not been called before him in 30 days. And listen, Mordecai, you need to understand that I know you're suffering and I know you're struggling and I know you're under crisis and you're thinking that I'm the answer here. But I just want you to know my reality is this. And I'm in a very vulnerable place too. See, they're together in crisis. We see her reality, but notice we see his reality. And that's found in verses 13 and 14. Remember I said he's going to come back with, with that, those same thoughts. Here's what he says in verse 13. He says, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. You know what he's saying? He's saying, Esther, if the law applies to you in appearing before the king, then the law also applies to you being a Jew. And you need to recognize that and acknowledge that. In other words, if you, if you think that you can escape the destruction that is coming to the rest of us outside of the walls of the palace. You think you can escape just because you're the queen. Well, that doesn't work really well for you if you decide you're going to appear before him uninvited. 
So he's, he's saying, listen, if the law applies in this area, the law applies in that area as well. His reality is, listen, don't think that just because you're the queen, you're safe. Eventually, you'll be discovered. And when you are, you will be destroyed along with the rest of us. That's, that's the reality he's laboring under. And you can imagine that as they're having this conversation, this back and forth, things are starting to sink in with her, don't you suppose? And she realizes, wait a minute. I'm as big a mess as anybody. It really is sink or swim. It, it really is that serious. And listen, you and I, we see the value of being together in crisis here. Here's why. She was thinking of things he wasn't, and he was thinking of things she wasn't. He had a present reality, and so did she. And listen, both were different, and both were very true. Neither thing that was said in verse number 11 or verse number 13 is false. All of it is right. It is true. It is real. This is, can I say, this is often the case as we approach problems and issues. I um, think to myself, there are times in which people come into my office and, or they'll call me on the phone or whatever the case might be and they'll, uh, they'll want to get my counsel and my advice on something. And uh, there are times when I'm sitting there and I, I impress myself with my counsel. <laughs> I'm being very facetious here. I'll say something, I'll say something that I think is just absolutely brilliant. I'll look at them, I'll say, here's what you need to do. And I mean, as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm thinking to myself, that is impressive. <laughs> do you know, do you know that in those moments, I, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the person that I'm counseling to look at me and to say, Pastor Pete, that's brilliant. I've never thought of that before. And I'm going to put that to practice, and I'm sure everything will be better. I mean, I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for that aha moment in my office. Did you know that not one time has that ever happened? <laughs> not one time, nor should it. Here, here, here's why. Here's why. Usually my reality, what I can see and what I can know from where I'm sitting is far different than their reality. And what, listen, what I'm saying is not, it's not untrue. In a perfect world, yeah, do what I'm telling you to do. But guys, the, the key is in a perfect world, and this world ain't perfect. And usually my counsel is met with this idea from the person saying, well, that sounds great, and I'd love to put that into practice, but... And then I'm sitting there going, I'm not as brilliant as I thought I was. Can I tell you that their communication presents two realities, and both of them were true, and both of them were real. And both of them had to be worked through. Notice, we see in the final element of this communication, we see bold faith on the part of Mordecai. Would you look in verse number 14? He says, For if thou in altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Oh, man, I love this guy. Mordecai, by faith, listen, he anticipated more than just deliverance. He anticipated enlargement, expansion, more. See, see, most of us, we wouldn't fault Mordecai at all. In fact, most of us, we would operate in this, just get me out of this mess. Just spare my life. Get me past the day that I'm supposed to be slain. But Mordecai, he wasn't just looking for that. He says, not only, not only do I anticipate that there's going to be deliverance, but I'm anticipating there's going to also be enlargement. I'm anticipating that God is going to expand our influence. He's not only going to protect our, us from absolute annihilation, but he is going to enlarge us. Uh, he is going to give us more influence. Uh, he is going to give us more than we currently possess in this moment. Listen, that is bold faith. And I'm here to propose we need more of that. We need more of that. I'm afraid too many of us, listen, too many of us have just sat by and just said, get me out of this mess. Get me out of this hot water. This is uncomfortable. I don't like it. And I, I think maybe God wants some people to say, Lord, don't just get me out of this mess, but Lord, would you, would you expand my horizons? Would you grow me spiritually? Would you give me more influence? Would you open up opportunities for me to share my faith with others as a result of this particular crisis that I'm in? Amen. Esther wasn't so sure, was she? I mean, you just see the lack of confidence, but Mordecai was confident, and that is the reason why, listen, it is so important to have togetherness. 
I think of my own relationship with my wife, and as we worked through the past year together, in moments in which I was strong, she was weak, and in moments in which I was weak, she was strong. And I'm talking about in our home, as we dealt with all of this mess that we're in. And how do we, you know, how, what do we tell our children, and, and, and what's the best thing for the church, and how do we move forward? And there, are, there were times, there were times as the pastor that I had made a decision, and, and I maybe got some, some pushback or some brushback on it, and thought to myself, maybe that was the wrong decision. My wife would come to me and she'd say, stay strong, you're doing the right thing. And then there were times uh, in which, you know, she had maybe made a decision about something and, and, uh, and then she's beginning to waver and, uh, and, and God allowed me to come alongside of her and to strengthen her. And I'm just simply saying, listen, this is why, this is why unity is so important during crisis. Amen. I want you to notice finally, and we'll finish tonight, the third thing that I find in this text is this, that prayer and fasting is impactful if there is to be a conclusion to the crisis. We must listen, we must come to the realization that some battles can only be won on our knees. You know, we like to fight with our fists and with our intellect and with our money and with our, 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 our wits and our common sense. But listen, there are, there are gonna be moments that you'll come to in life where you can only win the battle, you can only win the fight on your knees. Praying to God, crying out to Him, for deliverance. Notice the unity of their prayer and fasting is found in verse number 16. She says, go, Esther says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. She says, get, get everybody together. I'm getting ready. To, I'm going to put my life on the line. I'm going to go before the king. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do, but I'm not going to do it so long as I don't have your support. Amen. I'm not going to do it so long as I don't realize or don't, am not aware that you're on your knees, and not just you, Mordecai, but all of the Jews together are praying for me. Unity, unity of their prayer and fasting. She understood that while this was a physical battle and threat, ultimately, listen, ultimately, it was a spiritual one. The crisis, this crisis was not, was not to be concluded with physical power and strength, but with spiritual power and strength. Notice we see not only the unity of their prayer and fasting, but secondly, we see the duration of their prayer and fasting. She gives a specific time. She says three days, night and day. I don't want you to eat anything. I don't want you to drink anything. And I want you to spend the time that you would normally be eating, normally do, be doing these normal things. And I want you to spend them in prayer for me. You know, this was an intense time, wasn't it? No doubt they all were drained already. They were all weary already based on all that they had been through. They were all fatigued. They're all in mourning over all that they've already endured. And here's Esther and she's asking them, hey, listen, I want you to give a little more. I want you to sacrifice a little bit more. And Esther, listen, here is convinced, listen, I know that you've wept and I know that you've mourned and I know that you've cried out to God and I know that you're weary and you're fatigued, but she's saying there is more work to be done. I'm thinking to myself, you know, we, we in 2021, United States of America, here's what we want to do. We want to get down on our knees for five minutes and get up and assume that everything's going to be okay. The reality is, listen, the reality is that matters like this, major issues, major crises that visit our lives require much more than five minutes of prayer. Amen. Are you willing, am I willing to pay the price to truly get God's attention? Are you willing, listen, are you willing to do the work that is necessary to get through and obtain power from on high? The Bible indicates that there is a price to be paid there's a price to be paid to access this deep reservoir of God's power and strength. You know, the scriptures are full of people who were completely broken before they were able to see the full extent of God's power. And you know, time, time was often a crucial element in their growth and their development. Think about Noah. 120 years building the ark and waiting for God's wrath to fall. Think about Abraham. 25 years from the promise to the possession of the promise. Think about Moses. 40 years between murdering the Egyptian and finally getting the opportunity to lead God's people out of Egypt. Think about David. Did you know that David, there were 15 years between his anointing and him being crowned king? 15 years. That's a decade and a half between when Samuel visited his home and poured the oil on his head and when he went to Hebron and he finally was crowned king. It'd be another seven and a half years before he actually was king in Jerusalem. Think about Jesus. Did you know there were 30 years from his birth until the launch of his public ministry? 
I'm just simply saying, listen, that you and I, we may be amid crisis, and we think, listen, we think in our minds it should have been done yesterday. Can I remind you, pray and fast a little longer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Final thing that we see here is not only the unity of their prayer and fasting, the duration, but we see the focus of their prayer and fasting. They ask God for three things. And I want to ask this question of you and of me, of our church. What have we been asking God for? I, you've heard this said before. It's not originally with me, but I'm afraid. I know I do this. I know that my prayers, oftentimes, they're just so general. Lord, bless our church. Lord, bless this family. Bless is a good word. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. But what do we really want God to do? I believe here's the three things that they were praying for. Number one, they were praying for favor. They were praying for favor. She says in verse number 16, she says, You go and you pray. And I also in my maidens will do the same. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. You know what she's saying? She's saying, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to put my life on the line. And I'm praying, you pray with me that God gives us favor. That God gives us favor. Notice she prays for boldness. Boldness. Look what she says at the end of this. She says, I'm going to go in before him, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now it sounds good to say that. But you know as well as I do in the quiet moments when no one else was around, the, the force of those words must have hit her awfully hard, don't you suppose? If I perish, I perish. I'm too young to die. I've got a pretty good life here. I, I, I know Mordecai's out there and I'm concerned about him. He's a family member. I love him and all, but, but I've got a really good thing going here. If I perish, I perish. Don't you suppose that Night and day for three days that Mordecai was on his knees saying, God, give Esther boldness. Amen. Because we know, listen, we know how the enemy works, doesn't it? Don't we? And it's in those quiet moments when we're alone that oftentimes he comes and he begins to tempt us. He begins to throw things at us and he begins to play with our mind. I believe, I believe that that statement is an invitation. Dear, dear friends, pray, pray that God gives me boldness. And finally, she prays, and they pray for deliverance. Ultimately, this is what they're praying for. Why am I going before the king? Why am I putting myself in this position of, if I perish, I perish, for the Lord to somehow spare their lives and their people? Folks, what are you praying for tonight? I, I'm, I, I suppose it, it feels like, and again, there's been different iterations of this thing, but it, it feels like we're starting to trend out of the whole COVID thing. I, way, I could be way off on that. I, I could be way off on that. But it feels that way. Numbers are trending down. Of course, there's a vaccine out, and people are getting that. And I'm seeing people say stuff like there's a possibility. I saw somebody on Wall Street Journal say something like, I think by early April we can have herd immunity. Somebody else saying, I think by the summertime. And it feels like it. Listen, this, this, is, this, is, not, this is not the end of our crisis. This is not the end of our trials. If you think, if you think that we're going to come out of COVID and everything's just going to be fine and we're going to have wonderful lives like we had before, I want you to know something. Listen, the devil is working harder and he's fighting harder than he ever has before. And I'm telling you, listen, this, this, this battle that we're in today cannot be won. It cannot be won except for God's people getting on their knees. As I look across this room tonight, I'm looking at people that are in crisis and my heart breaks for you. And I want you to know something, that even though I don't know what it's like to be where you are, I want to do what I can to pray for you. Do what I can to be there to support you. And I believe I'm looking around at a church who has the same heart. You heard the note that was read earlier this, this evening regarding our people. This is a giving church. It's a serving church. I think, I think God would be pleased if we spent, we spent some time on our knees tonight recognizing and understand that we're in crisis mode. And God has given us a precious gift, and that is togetherness. That is a church family who is here to support one another, to love one another. And may God help us. May God help us to be there for one another in moments of difficulty and crisis. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Do you consider your crisis hour and your crisis moment Maybe you should ask yourself a few questions. How long did it take you to acknowledge that you're in a crisis moment? Remember, time is of the essence. How is your communication 
with your spouse, with others. You know, I, I know, I know we tend to be private. Sometimes we like to, I, I've had people tell me, and, you know, don't tell anybody, I just want to, I don't want anybody to know, and I understand that. I understand there are moments in which it needs to be private. But I want you to know something. I believe communication is vital. Let's talk about it. Let's pray together about it. During your crisis, did you spend enough time in prayer? Not just prayer, but maybe also in fasting? Or were you and I, were we given over to following the media? Spending time on social media and worrying than we were in fervent prayer. Folks, this is a crisis hour. There's work to be done. And that's why God gives us a church. That's why God gives us a family. That's why God brings us together for the crisis moment.